All right. Well, last week, uh, Pastor Mike kicked off the uh, new series, Family Matters, uh, by focusing on Psalm 90 and how we thrive in Christ in, by living wisely and considerate of the time that God has given us here on this earth. The goal of this series is for us to consider, what does it look like for us in the various circles, relationships, to truly thrive in Christ? Now, I've titled my message today, Single-Minded, and the message today is going to deal with singleness and marriage. And as I was praying for direction in the message, I was led to 1 Corinthians 7. And this is a pretty, like, controversial chapter. Paul says some really difficult things, and it's been taken out of context and misused numerous times. But Paul has a lot to say about relationships in this chapter to the Corinthian church. And we'll read and unpack that in a moment. But what becomes very clear is what Paul is expressing to the Christians in Corinth and for us today was a single-mindedness. Now, the definition of being single-minded, according to Webster's Dictionary, is having one driving purpose or resolve. See what I did there? <laughs> so whether single or married, you may be holding your breath right now and possibly thinking today would have been a good day to sleep in. Well, I want to assure you that this message is meant to not only affirm both singleness and marriage, but to proclaim a calling on each and every one of us to be single-minded in our devotion to Christ. So let's read from Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church, chapter 7, beginning in verse 29. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin, is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. So what Paul is saying here is we are called to be single-minded in our devotion to Christ. And that is the main point of this message drawn from verse 35 here. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Now, full disclosure, I can't, I just want to let you know that Paul was single when he was writing this. And I can't help but think if, Paul, or uh, Peter, who was married, was writing something like this if he would have caught a little flack for it. I don't know. But what we do know is that Paul is writing this with very, very clear intention. But to understand some of the things that were said, we need to understand two things that influences Paul's writing. And I was actually talking to uh, Pastor Mike earlier this morning, and I was just saying the more I read Paul's writings, it always comes back to these two things. The gospel and the imminent return of Jesus. It doesn't matter whether it's Romans, Philippians, any letter, it always goes back to these two things as influencing exactly what he's saying. And first, it needs to be for us in our understanding. As I talk about singleness and marriage, it's not gonna mean, it's not going to land, it's not going to take root in our hearts if we don't understand these two things. Because just as powerful as they were 2,000 years ago for Paul, 
they should be for us today. And so in the gospel, like, and just for, to kind of get everybody on the same page, Paul, who was identified as Saul of Tarsus, was persecuting the church. And then on the way to Damascus to persecute more Christians, because he wasn't just happy in Jerusalem, he was going elsewhere. He meets Jesus. In this revelation, he is radically transformed. The one who he was persecuting has now enlisted him in service. And the message of the gospel takes root in Paul's life. And that message is that God sent his son into the world to live a perfect and sinless life, only to go to the cross to die on our behalf, to atone for our sins, to cover all the wrong things that we've ever done, not just against each other, but against God. This is the good news, is that you've not done anything to deserve this, that this was God's plan. God initiated this 2,000 years before we ever existed, that God was concerned, that God wanted to redeem a people to himself. That's good news, right? It doesn't end there. Because not only did Jesus die to atone for our sins, three days later, he comes back to life in the resurrection, conquering death as a promise, as a first fruits for us so that we can look to Jesus's resurrection and know that after our lives are over, that we too will experience the resurrection in the very same way. And we're not talking about like a ghost floating around. Jesus hung out with the disciples for 40 days after the resurrection, eating with them, hanging out, walking along the way, talking to them. That's the resurrection we're talking about. Now, everybody will be resurrected. Some to judgment, and some to life forever, for eternity with Jesus. I don't know about you, that sounds pretty awesome, right? That's, that's a message that transforms our lives, right? Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> it transformed Paul's life, the apostles, and for 2,000 years, it has been radically changing the earth, generation by generation. And here we are in our generation hearing this 2,000-year-old message and allowing it to transform each and every one of us. That is the foundation of this and every message as a follower of Jesus Christ. It is this message that Paul accepted and went to the ends of the earth to make sure absolutely everybody knew about it. But why was he going so hard to do that? Well, because here's the other piece. Because when Jesus was ascending, he was also talking about coming back. And this is the hope. This was the promise that we read throughout our Bibles is that really they were surprised in the way that the Messiah, Jesus, came the first time around. What many Jews are looking to is really something that the church misses today in this imminent return, that at any point, Jesus could come back. But he's not coming back to just pardon everybody, right? He's not just coming back to be like, you're forgiven and you're forgiven. Not like that at all. He's coming back with judgment. That's a huge blind spot in the church today. And it's one that I think if we just grasp a little bit of it, it will radically transform the trajectory of our lives. Just like it did for Paul. Just like it did for the apostles. Why were they willing to travel throughout the Mediterranean? Why were they putting their lives on the line? Because of how glorious the gospel is 
And the fact that they couldn't reconcile sitting at home, holding it and keeping it to themselves, knowing that judgment was coming. That at any moment, Jesus would come back with judgment. Or that our lives would expire. Because that's part of this, is facing our own mortality, but embracing immortality in Christ. And those are things that we have to hold in tension. That eternity, while on our side, our lives are finite. And that we know that whether up until the point we expire, at any point Jesus could come back. And we don't want to see anyone suffer. That's how glorious the gospel is. It moves us to share this message. It moves us to change. Even if we've been walking with the Lord for 20, 30, 40 years or five minutes, we are continually looking to be transformed by the Holy Spirit of the living God for the glory of God alone. That is the foundation of this. Now you might be thinking, Luke, singleness and marriage? Yeah, because it starts here. It starts right here with understanding the gospel and really how short our lives are, that they will go by in the blink of an eye. And I might get some amens on that one, right? Time goes so fast. And this is the context for what Paul is writing. Uh, Commentary from Ben Witherington III. For Paul, the one thing of eternal significance that humans can do in this world is serve the Lord. Proclaiming the good news of eternal salvation available through the crucified Messiah, Jesus. Paul is not so narrow-minded that he thinks all must become full-time missionaries like himself, but he does believe that all must bear witness in whatever social situation they find themselves with their lives and their words. We are called to be single-minded in our devotion to Christ. And verses 29 and 31 bear out what I've been talking about with what I mean, brothers and sisters, in that the time is short. For this world in its present form is, pressing, is passing away. And, and that's why Paul is saying some of these more difficult things in this passage, because for him, being married, it, it's kind of a burden because here we are trying to move towards furthering the kingdom of God, but somebody's attention is now divided because they're caring for a spouse. They have to be considerate of a spouse as well as the Lord. And so in Paul's mind, being single, that's it. That's where it's at. Paul was single. (laughs) But he was also unrestricted in his devotion to the Lord and he could go and travel all around, not hesitating, putting his life on the line and not really having to consider his spouse or kids or anything like that. And so, and also with the idea of Jesus coming back with judgment, that, that's war, that's crisis, that's famine, all of these other things happening at this time and that we're actually happening in Paul's time, just like they're happening in our time. And so what Paul is getting at is in the single-minded devotion to Christ, of serving him, that being the main focus And so uh, Craig Keener in IVP background commentary says, with the death and resurrection of Christ, the impending last days began and will be fulfilled with the coming of Christ that will be preceded with war and crisis. Because of this, Paul believes that it is better not to marry. So this absolutely frames just Paul's entire view of marriage and singleness. But So what happens as a result of being single-minded in our devotion to Christ? Because we don't just stop there. With the power of the gospel, with the transformative power of it, with understanding the imminent return of Jesus, how does it frame our lives today? Well, being single-minded in our devotion to Christ, it informs our identity. Our identity is in Christ. For all of us who claim Christ, our identity is found in him. 
more so than the roles that we've accepted, whether it be a spouse, whether it be an employee, an engineer, a soldier, anything. Christ is number one. Our identity is found in him. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Our identity is a child of God. He also writes in 2 Corinthians 5, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. We are a new creation. So how does our identity in Christ pertain to singleness and marriage? Well, our identity is not wrapped up in someone other than Christ. It's not in a spouse you do or do not have. And you can only imagine how this would influence the dynamic in a relationship. Many times, single people are just looking to get married, thinking that that will bring happiness, that that will bring a fullness. But that's not the case. Many are disappointed, sometimes hours after a wedding. Sometimes, Weeks, months, years. And this is the key part is that we, our identity is not in our spouse. It's not in all of these other roles that we have in life. It is solely to be anchored in Christ. You are complete in Christ. Now, there's many messages throughout the world, but one of which, and this is a Jerry Maguire reference, right? You complete me. You're looking for your other half, your better half. And that's, that's false. Because that's not what we should be looking for. Our wholeness, our completeness, our fullness is in Christ Jesus. And when we take that pressure off of our spouses or off those in our close relationship circles, we are free to be who we are in Christ, and so are they. Instead of putting and heaping on expectations, why aren't you making me happy? It's selfish. We find our joy in Christ, not as a result of somebody else. If there are those needs in your relationship, look to Christ Find wholeness and completeness in Christ. If you are young and looking forward to marriage, let's save a whole lot of heartache and (laughs) unmet expectations and just find this now. Christ is it. Press in to your identity in Christ. Paul writes in Colossians 2, So then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. In Christ, you have been brought to fullness. This also can address loneliness. I know a lot of times we think, oh, single people must be lonely. But married people can be lonely too. And sometimes it's a little bit saltier because you have this capacity for closeness and knowing and being known, but, but it falls short. It's a, almost a darker loneliness. But that's when we're not finding our relationship, our identity in Christ. When we find our wholeness, our fullness in Christ, we're never alone. We recognize that we are fully known 
by the Lord. Tim Keller writes in The Meaning of Marriage, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. If our focus and devotion is on Christ and not finding it in ourselves or others, then we can thrive and thriving only happens in Christ. Next, Paul uh, writes, and so the idea of single-minded devotion to Christ shapes our relationships. Though devotion to Christ and identity firmly planted in him, it will then shape our relationships and not just married relationships in every relationship. And by doing this, we can avoid codependency or feelings of inadequacy because our identity is in Christ and that affects how we relate to others. It brings us to a point of reflecting God's love and forgiveness. Paul writes in Colossians chapter three, therefore, as God's chosen people, an identity statement here, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now, a lot of times we're reading, we understand the context that Paul is actually writing to the church. And so for everyone, this applies, that we can share the love of God with all of those around us, that we are putting these attributes of Christ on because our identity is in Christ. But what we often neglect is the microcosm of each of us as an individual and the immediate relationships we have. We want to do this with others, but those that we know best and those who know us best, why do we have so much trouble doing this? They should be the first line, to the, first, the front row of receiving the overflowing of what we experience with God. God's love, God's grace, his forgiveness, that should be overflowing from us onto those around us. And spouses are not an exception. Kids are not an exception. This is where they see the gospel come alive. Why are statistics for the church and the world the same? for divorce, for really pick any, any fault of the world, we see it here. And that needs to change because it's our testimony. This is our time. This is our generation. What does our devotion to Christ look like? Because this message has the potential, not my message, the gospel for clarifying, (laughs) has the potential to change our homes. It changes our families. It changes our relationships. And it's not just for your kids. It's for grandkids. It's for great grandkids. It's for all of those around you that you are encouraging in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is how it shapes our relationships. In John chapter 14, in John chapter 13, Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, this is the only quote that's not from Paul. It's Jesus, so it totally gets a pass. But here's the idea. Here's the crux of it is that when we love others, we are known as disciples of Jesus. That's how important this is. And so those in our immediate proximity need to see that love. It doesn't need to be in a mission trip. It doesn't need to be a thousand miles away. It should be a part of that. But most immediately, what is the testimony that we are living out individually of our devotion to Christ? This is what the next generation needs to see. This is what our friends need to see. 
Paul writes in Ephesians 4, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Just run that through the filter of your closest relationships. Is that in view? On the foundation of the gospel of Jesus' imminent return, is this a goal for creating unity within your social circles within your family. 1 Corinthians 13, that's the love chapter, right? And just for the record, Paul wasn't writing this as wedding material. That wasn't his intention. Hey guys, here's some great lines for a wedding. That's not it at all. What he was actually talking about was relationships within the church. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And this only comes through our devotion to Christ because there's many, many times that we do not feel like doing these things, right? Let's be honest. (laughs) Got an amen. There we go. That's what I was looking for. So, but this is the power of God that the Holy Spirit can still work through us and remind us of our identity in Christ and that we can still do these things, that it goes beyond the power that we have ourselves, but this is where we press into Christ and he has to be our focus It has to be our frame of mind to actually do these things. So remember that on your drive home or if you're single, when you're going to meet somebody, remember these words that Christ is our focus. It has to be our frame of mind so that we can live these things out to those who are most important to us. So whether you're single or married, it's how we thrive in Christ. When we live these things out, we change the world. One person at a time. Because they need to see this. The world needs to see this. But we're just living it out. We're just following Jesus. We're not doing it for a show. Because I think a lot of times that's the disconnect. That's where it doesn't translate into home. And that's why we have so many kids leaving the church. They need to see the gospel at home. They need to hear these conversations, honest conversations about what our life in Christ looks like. And if they've never heard that, it's not too late. Start today. Talk about what our identity in Christ means what it means for you and be real about it. Don't just give the churchy answers because they need to hear that. They can't just be sent out into the world with cliches, even Christian ones. And as real as it is for you and as real as you make it, that's what they need to hear. And that's what our friends need to hear. And that's how we quit doing church and actually be the church. That's how that transformation happens. So there's a Crossway article how both singleness and marriage testify to the gospel. The ways we misunderstand singleness reflects the fact that we're looking to marriage in unbiblical and unhealthy ways. Both marriage and singleness testify to the gospel. Marriage shows us the shape of the gospel in that it models the covenant promises that God has made to us in Christ. Singleness shows us the sufficiency of the gospel because it shows us the reality of what marriage points to, which is our own relationship with Jesus. And this leads us to contentment. As Paul proclaims in Philippians 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And as we talked about in this last series, uh, actually series before last, and Paul is talking about that contentment in light of a lot of the struggles and the persecution that he's had to endure. And he is finding that contentment in Christ. I think this absolutely applies to relationships too. How would an extra dose of contentment help shape your relationships? 
How would it change the expectations? And maybe stop running after the expectations put on us by the world. Because we're running everything through that filter of our identity in Jesus Christ. We find our contentment in him. And so for those closest to us, we are encouraging them. It's not what we can get from them. And what we're giving to them is Christ. What we're showing to them is Christ. We're creating an atmosphere of growth in Christ. It's not to chase after the things of the world. And I think a lot of times that's what we have resorted to with Christian trimmings. The goal of even marriage is not just to raise little humans who are going to contribute to the world. It's to contribute to the kingdom of God. So they could be the best sports player. They could be the smartest engineer or whatever. But if we're not leading them to Christ, for them to find their identity in Christ, to further the kingdom of God, in Jesus' name, we're missing. We're missing the mark. And if we're single and we have all of these relationships and we're just getting all of these personal needs met, but we're not moving anybody towards Christ, we're missing the mark. Jesus is everything. He needs to be our single-minded devotion to him, the object of all of that. So as we see the, the single-minded devotion to Christ, it informs our identity, it shapes our relationships, it also determines our mission. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul writes, I would like you to be free from concern. So this is what we read earlier and just the idea of like, oh, what is Paul talking about here, right? But it is that imminent return of Jesus. It's the mission of Jesus that has so captured Paul that he writes this. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. It's true. Where is our focus? Where is our devotion? Even for being married, we can be so devoted to Christ that that is the foundation that our whole relationship is really built on. It's not compatibility. It's not whether I like you today or not. It's not, let's have little humans and get them out of the house 18 years later. Because then what happens, you're looking at each other and you're like, I don't know you. What do we have in common? That's an epidemic. Divorce is happening at that stage and in many other stages because, because we take our eyes off of Christ. Because Christ wasn't the foundation. Christ has to be the foundation. That is how we stay on the same page. That is the foundation of every Christian relationship. At least it should be. And it's not too late. If yours is not, it can be, and it can start today. And it just starts with very real conversations of what Jesus means to you and how that impacts your life. Followed by, how can I live out the gospel better? How can I show you Jesus better? And so that is how that's part of the mission. That's how we keep moving this forward because we can't just be looking at the outskirts and we can't just be going to the other side of the world if, if we're not shoring up things at home, personally, in those most immediate relationships. Paul also writes in 1 Corinthians 5, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us 
the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Isn't that beautiful? A message of reconciliation. How many of us need that message in our hearts, in our lives, in our relationships? Be reconciled to one another. Even in your marriage, even if you have divorce papers at home, be reconciled to one another. Be honest to God. Be honest before each other. Be honest to yourself. What does Jesus mean to you? What does the gospel mean to you? Tim Keller writes, Paul says that both being married and not being married are good conditions to be in. We should be neither overly elated by getting married nor overly, overly disappointed by not being so because Christ is the only spouse that can truly fulfill us, God's family, the only family that will truly embrace and satisfy us. We are called to, single-minded, to be single-minded in our devotion to Christ. It informs our identity, it shapes our relationships, and it determines our mission. Please pray with me. Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. And it's my prayer that in everyone's heart, in my heart, that your gospel will lay deep roots. Continue to transform us. Continue to make us more into the image of Christ. Father, I pray that we are each, by your spirit, evaluating what does our devotion to Christ look like in our lives, in these lives that we have spent so much time building up that maybe we're not on the foundation of Christ. And I pray that now, that even now that you begin to strip that away, help us to see our lives as you see them. Help us to listen to your Holy Spirit as we comb through our lives Let us be zealous for your kingdom. Let us be zealous for the hearts of those around us, for our spouses, for our kids, for grandkids, for great-grandkids, for all of our friends, for parents. That, Father, we can see everyone thrive in Christ, knowing that by living this out, we too will thrive. That we are living with eternity in mind and not just for this world, not just for retirement, that your kingdom is worth so much more. Help us to be faithful and good stewards. Father, I pray that your light would shine in each and every one of us. Illuminate the darkness. And I pray I pray your blessing on everyone who is willing to to test these things out, to take these steps to creating a home, a life devoted to Christ. That you would be honored and glorified. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. May, May Yahweh bless you this week in your devotion to Christ. I pray that you see it a thousandfold coming back to you. You are dismissed.